Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome back to New Books in German Studies, a podcast channel of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Leah Greenberg. Today, I'm delighted to be talking with Thomas O. Hawkinson about his latest book, Grotesque Visions, The Science of Berlin Dada, published this year by Bloomsbury Academic. Welcome, Tom. Leah, thank you so much. It's really, really lovely to be here. Yes, and it's great to um, hear you again um, after we hadn't seen each other since we were both um, participating, I as a doctoral student and you as an academic sponsor in the Berlin program uh, in Berlin in 2018-2019. Um, and I hear you've got some friends joining us today. Um, so I guess I'll just go ahead um, listing off um, all of your wonderful accomplishments and where you are. So Tom is an associate professor in the Graduate Critical and Visual Studies Program, as well as in the Undergraduate Critical Studies Program and the Visual Studies Program at California College of the Arts in San Francisco and Oakland, California. He earned his BA at uh, Drake University and his MA and PhD from the University of Minnesota. And his doctorate was in comparative literature. Um, And he also has uh, graduate level minors in German and history of science and technology. He is the co-editor of the book series, Visual Cultures and German Contexts with Bloomsbury Academic. And he is former co-editor of the book series, German Visual Culture with Peter Lang, Oxford. He's also co-edited several anthologies. Um, There are too many things to list, but um, I'll leave it there. And I appreciate you taking the time um, to talk with me about your new book today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So I guess we'll get started uh, talking about um, this ambitious book that brings together a lot of different threads. So it talks about philosophy and critical theory, the so-called Dada art movement, the grotesque, the history of science and the consolidation of various scientific fields in Berlin in the late uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. So I thought you could maybe start by telling us a bit more about what your broader and clearly very diverse research program is and what your path was to this particular research project. Yeah, happy to do it. And uh, I, I hopefully my, my companions uh, in the background won't, in, won't jump in again to share their perspectives as well. Sometimes they, they're supportive of my research and sometimes they want to go outside and go for a walk. My dogs do. Um, yeah, so, so uh, the, the research path, it's actually, um, you know, my background is really uh, interdisciplinary by design, I think, or by default, maybe is a better way to phrase it. I, I um, my undergraduate work, much like yours, Leah, was in, a, in kind of in, in Iowa of all places. I think we both studied in Iowa. I was at a university there and was studying economics and international relations, and I sort of came to German um, as a, a, a kind of side interest uh, late in my academic undergraduate academic career. And um, I think it, it belies the fact. Uh, you know, that a lot of my scholarship, even today, really does try to focus on two or three different uh, fields or academic disciplines, uh, in a sense, kind of touching in a number of areas uh, at the same time. Um, uh, And that's, I I can't say exactly why that's the case, although I did find when I was at Drake University and had this really fantastic uh, course on Weimar culture with uh, now retired Rebecca Peterson, uh, that when we discussed photo montage in particular in the works of uh, a rather well-known Berlin Dadaist, Hannah Höch, uh, who was a really influential visual artist, or, and, and today is much discussed, I think, much more so than, than she was during her time, perhaps. Um, photo montage, at least in Hannah Höch's versions, uh, was an integration of different media sources, some, some photographs, photo-illustrated press cutouts, paintings, drawings, uh, that she compiled together and, and glued together and, and to create her sort of fantastic uh, comments on contemporary cultural activities in, in, the, in, in Weimar, Germany in the 20s and into the 30s. And then she continued the practice until she passed in, in the 70s. So um, I think uh, my, my research program is just in general very interdisciplinary. It still focuses a lot on the avant-garde um, because I, I think that particular artistic practice allows for a kind of criticality that I appreciate when I kind of think about interdisciplinary practices. Uh, and then um, Hannah Hook's work in particular sort of embodied that for me when I first came across her in, in uh, this Weimar uh, cultures class uh, way back 
I, I don't even want to say the year. It was many years ago, Leah, many years ago. <laughs> And what brought you then in particular, so you talked about Hannah Hur, you also focus um, quite a bit on a figure I was not aware of, the philosopher and poet, satirist, Salomo Friedländer. Um, what then brought, uh, for example, his work into your project? Yeah, he is such an interesting figure for me. And I have to say, part of it was, you know, I, I stumbled across Hannah Hur uh, by chance um, uh, through the work of Maria Makala, who at the time, Uh, I was an undergraduate, was also, uh, oddly enough, living in Des Moines uh, with her partner, her husband, um, Neil uh, Benezra, who was uh, director of the, uh, the museum in Des Moines. And uh, Maria Mackel had written an, an essay about Hannah Hick's work that mentioned Friedlander in passing. And I had gotten a hold of a copy of this catalog and, and then started to research Friedlander a little bit and came across uh, Timothy Benson's work. Uh, Timothy Benson, who's now at um, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, wrote this really wonderful text, one of the earliest uh, studies of Raoul Hausman in English, I think. And uh, he, uh, Timothy Benson, also addresses um, Friedlander in greater detail. And it struck me as interesting. Friedlander it was such an important philosophical voice for the Berlin Dada movement in particular. There, there were many iterations of Dada, as some folks may know. You know, it started in Switzerland and uh, you know, uh, and and then moved Berlin, Cologne, uh, Hanover, certainly Paris, New York saw iterations of Dada in the t 1910s and 1920s. Um, but Friedlander was such an important philosophical voice for the Berlin movement, and he, yet he was so marginalized, much like Hannah Hirsch at the time. Um, you know, before Maria Makala's scholarship, uh, no one had been talking about Friedlander. And, and then I stumbled across um, his name and then uh, Timothy Benson sort of alerted me in, in Benson's scholarship to Friedlander's significance. And um, from there, I was sort of started to dig and, uh, and just kept digging and digging and digging. And Friedlander seemed more and more important the more I, I dug. And... And I'll take a moment now to return to the title, um, which is Grotesque Visions. And so um, I think almost more than it is about the grotesque, the, the book is about vision and the visual and and how um, seeing was, um, was theorized and was... Um, Uh, was developed as a sort of central feature of science in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in, no. um, in Germany. And so I was wondering if you could um, sort of outline for listeners what some of the radical shifts in thinking about vision were in the early 20th century. And it's funny that we're talking about vision on a, a non-visual <laughs> medium. That's yeah, true. Um, so, yeah, a bit more about the theorization, the, the politics and the mobilization of vision that you talk about. And how did it change in this period? Yeah. Well, in short, uh, the changes were uh, in the late 19th century that I kind of uh, trace in the book and, and turning into the 20th century were around uh, sort of empirical scientific methods uh, used to kind of understand how the eye operated, uh, how the eye operates, how other forms of sensory present uh, uh, sensory perception actually function. So there were real efforts, and for I think a number of reasons, the late 19th century was so important for sense physiology. Uh, certainly, there were advances in science in a number of areas. And, and Rudolf Virchow, for example, is a key figure in the book, um, and he represents sort of embodies a lot of the discourses. He was a, a cellular pathologist. Uh, in, in the mid 1800s and then became more more specifically focused on anatomical pathology and uh, then became a, a politician in the late 1900s or the late 1800s. So uh, he started the uh, Progressive Party, was a lead figure in the Progressive Party, and, and there was a well-known political figure, but also this very active scientist. Um, and the idea was that you needed to sort of empirically demonstrate how vision worked and try to find some sort of universal um, explanation for how uh, vision in this case operated and where it was located in the mind or in the eye uh, or some somewhere in between. And those practices uh, both I, I found as I was doing research and, and reading a, a lot about the sense physiologists, uh, you know, uh, Emile dubois Raymond, uh, Hermann von Helmholtz and others, you know, with, with colleagues at the Max Planck Institute for History of Science in Berlin, um, we had this reading group and just discovering that as much as the sense physiologists during this period were trying to explain how vision worked and other senses actually worked to try to find some universal truths, 
Um, we were also seeing the way in which other scientific discourses, for example, anthropology or sexual science, sexology, um, were also taking up uh, visual evidence as a way to sort of prove their claims about the truth of certain human races or certain human sexual predispositions, gender orientations, gender identities. And they seem to be really um, kind of, if not paradoxical, then contradictory, the fact that, that a number of fields in sense physiology were questioning how vision could even operate as a universal truth, yet other scientific fields were saying, uh, we're using visual evidence to demonstrate the truth of the human uh, condition or certain human characteristics more broadly. So there was a real contradiction in there. And um, so a part of it is I wanted to get at that in, in the book project. And I looked at scholarship. Uh, Andrew Zimmerman's work on uh, anthropology and antihumanism in Imperial Germany was so important. H. Glenn Penny's work about objects and displays um, in museums of the 19th and 20th century was super influential as well. And then other people like Frederick Schwartz and, and Janet Ward even doing work about visual culture and scientific discourses during the same period I found really, really helpful. So just lots of contradictions in this turn toward empirical proof around uh, the certainty of, of vision specifically and, and sense perception in general. Yeah, and, and that's uh, one one phrase that, that recurs in your book is this idea of see and learn and to, to learn to see. And and that's also tied with something that I found very interesting. You mentioned Rudolf uh, Virchow, um, which is this idea, which I think also feel, feels very timely of how do we communicate scientific information and what are the risks and rewards of making scientific discoveries or scientific developments or knowledge legible to the public or quote unquote lay audience. Um, so I wanted you to maybe talk more about how that's dealt with in your book and how art in particular, and in particular the grotesque, which we'll talk about more, is able to respond in this debate or this question of whether the public can be quote unquote trusted um, to engage in the ambiguities of science or, or as it were, the denials of the ambiguities of science. Yeah. Well, I was seeing an interesting parallel between, like I said, there were these these kind of debates happening in, in, across various scientific fields at the time, sense physiologists in particular, uh, thinking about sense perception, and then other scientific fields sort of taking up the senses as, as if they were the, the unquestionable vehicles of truth. And so what I really did like is, is when people like Fierschau uh, would set up these displays, uh, you know, his Institute of uh, his uh, Pathological Museum, for example, which still exists today in, in, in some form. I've been to um, it. Yeah, have you, the Berlin yeah. Brandenburg Medical Historical Museum, mm -hmm. which has a sort of interesting, somewhat conflicted history to its origins. Um, the fear shows a, a, a intent, I think, was, um, and I don't want to say this even because it sounds so crass, was very noble <laughs> in the work he was doing. I mean, he was a cellular pathologist. Uh, to start, he became an ana you know, more directly, more explicitly identified with anatomical pathology um, and then fighting diseases and illnesses. And then um, a lot of his work was taken up by uh, anthropologists, physical anthropologists in particular. Um, he was a humanitarian in, in the broadest sense of the term in a way, I think. Um, but nevertheless, some of his, his research did end up supporting some of the more exploitive dimensions of anthropological practice, including you know things like um, colonialism and, and Germany's efforts to sort of justify its colonial activities. And um, so there, there's that dimension. I mean, Carl Hagenbeck uh, also factors in at some level here, who is notorious for um, sort of using and being part of some of the anthropological circles, but bringing not only uh, captured, quote unquote, foreign exotic animals to display in Germany and European zoos, but also people. Uh, under the same auspices, that there was this this sort of a need to educate the public around these kinds of things, and you know, so Fierschau's own trajectory is a little bit, um, you know, tricky to navigate. And I think if you go to the Berlin Brandenburg Museum today, they they do honor his work. You know, it's it's. I was fascinated when I went the first time, Leah, and this was, gosh, I'm embarrassed to admit this. It was probably 1998 or 1999, um, and I was fascinated because they they did have the number of jars of pickled and preserved specimens, human, you know, human organs, you know, not to uh, gross anybody out, but also, you know, various uh, kind of fetal uh, developments that were uh, kind of preserved for um, educational purposes among the medical scientists at the, the Charité Museum, the Charité Hospital, uh, but then also used in the public museum portion 
uh, to help educate the public. So there was this this sort of um, I think Fearshow's intent, intentions were good in educating the public, showing how um, morphological developments were the result of cellular problems that you know a, a misshapen uh, cellular reproductive practice would end up in a physically visible. Uh, kind of uh, abnormality, uh, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, but I think the thing that I loved about the the artists that are in the study, and and uh, you know, Friedlander is a is a is a super important figure here, Hannah. But there's also a Dutch writer, uh, and and who is not really a visual artist, but was identified with the distill movement or the style uh, in in the Netherlands and came to Berlin, uh, Til Bruchman. Um, who was who wrote about um, um, some of the displays in Fierschau's uh, medical museum and, and other uh, medical displays in Berlin, and just this sense that these artists like Bruchmann and Höch and 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 uh, Friedlander were not necessarily saying science doesn't have any validity and can't really do anything to help humanity. What they were very critical of was sort of the, um, what Friedlander had this beautiful phrase, the merely illusory paradise of habits. Mm -hmm. And they really wanted to engender through their artistic practice, I think, and and sort of try to argue in the book, a kind of critical reception of scientific information. Um, And uh, I think there are parallels to, you know, kind of contemporary conversations around science. And certainly this happened this has happened before where, you know, we, we question expertise and challenge uh, expertise and see people, um, you know, kind of, you know, in, in contemporary parlance, poo-pooing vaccines, for example, even though scientists, for the most part, think they're very good things. Um, the artists I look at aren't saying science is necessarily something to poo-poo. They're saying, let's be critical about the information and uh, see what it's doing uh, in the larger scope of, of uh, a human betterment and human interest. So. Uh, there's there's that element that I think is really key. Mm-hmm. And and to that end, you talk about the different tactics that these artists use, and, and one of the central ones sort of being the grotesque, or mm-hmm. also grotesque could be used as an adjective, but use it also as a noun. And I was wondering if you could sort of lay out, there's a lot of interesting research and, and different um, areas in which the grotesque manifests itself. Um, so I was wondering if you could lay out what... Uh, grotesque means for you in, in this book mm-hmm. um, and and sort of how it works alongside this um, issue of, of contemporary science. Yeah. You know, the grotesque, it's such an interesting concept because it has a weird history. <laughs> it, it, it's history itself. The term uh, is, is sort of historically disjointed. Um, it comes from uh, the late 1400s. It's an Italian origin, a grotesque, grotto-like, and it was was basically um, archaeologists in in Rome, uh, Italian archaeologists uh, in Rome, kind of uncovering um, what they assumed were underground grottos that were built with these beautifully painted frescoes with you know elaborate metallic paints and very colorful uh, kinds of figures that were hybrids of humans and animals and, and plants and animals. And they thought, uh, you know, these are underground paintings. They're, it's like some sort of honorific uh, grotto. So they were called grotesque, this particular kind of, um, these particular hybrid figures and forms that they discovered. But the grotto they, they had found was actually built in the first century common era uh, and under the, the rule of, of the emperor Nero uh, sometime after 64 common era. Uh, and the way the history works, every time an, an emperor was was dethroned in Rome, um, the the next emperor would sort of destroy all the key buildings and then just build on top of them. So Nero's most elaborate creation was this thing called the Domus Aria, the Golden Bath. And uh, when when Nero was deposed and, and uh, fell from power, um, the 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 next emperor sort of destroyed the bath and built on top of it. And uh, some of the frescoes were preserved and then rediscovered. And in, in, I think it was in the 1480s or maybe even the 1490s. And, and that's where the term actually comes from. So it has a kind of art historical archaeological origin, uh, which I think is kind of interesting, um, especially for fans of Foucault's idea, Michel Foucault's idea of archaeology of knowledge. It's quite literally a kind of, <laughs> it comes from an archaeological event. Of this term, but it does have such varied uses in the contemporary. 
and this, I mean, one can trace, uh, you know, and I don't do this fully in the book. Uh, other folks do this quite well in the 19th century, some of the work being done by German romantics um, and, and, and uh, the idea of the grotesque is kind of a, um, a playful decorative. The arabesque is sometimes used as an interchangeable term. Um, there is a font and I teach at an art and design college and I always love to talk about the font uh, um, accidents grotesque, which is a Swiss typeface, um, which was developed um, by uh, folks who wanted to have clear non-decorative displays of information that later uh, kind of evolved into what is known as Helvetica today, which is one of the most common fonts typefaces that we use for, for road signage and subway signage. Um, and so the font, the typeface history is totally opposite of the, the history of the, the art historical concept of the grotesque and that art historically uh, the grotesque becomes associated with the arabesque and the decorative and the playful and the whimsical. Um, so there are these various permutations. And, and w- one of the you know things I do in the book is talk a little bit about Mikhail Bakhtin, whose, whose work on grotesque realism is sort of well known and, and who's very much interested in the, in the human body and sort of its carnivalesque and playful uh, forms. Um, and then Wolfgang Kaiser, who's a fairly well-known German historian of the grotesque, who has a very different take. Um, and, and so uh, what I, what I want to do in the book, what I try to do is focus on these particular artists in Berlin and Friedlander is the kind of key figure here and kind of coming up with a particular concept of the grotesque um, and explain how they were using this, this amorphous term as a particular critical strategy uh, to engage what was happening in the scientific communities and, 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 and the kind of tumultuous period that is Weimar Germany. And so, uh, sort of, which direction then did Friedlander take the the idea of the grotesque or the term grotesque? Yeah, you know, it was it's uh, it, it also this kind of take that Friedlander has people like Raoul Hausmann, who is a very good friend of Friedlander, who I don't really talk a great deal about in, in the book because there's so much scholarship on Hausmann and, and justifiably so, I think, but also uh, you know problematically so, and that uh, people like Hannah Huth and maybe others don't get as much attention as they as they should. For Friedlander, the grotesque. Um, was was a kind of synthesis like you couldn't um, he had this this kind of almost metaphysical idea of a unity uh, of of opposites and this is something that was sort of fairly common in, in data circles uh, they, when when we read and, and 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 study kind of some of the data figures of the 1910s and 1920s they're always talking about juxtaposition like there's there's one side of the story that's on the surface and another side of the story that's implicit and not being told and not revealed so um, for Friedlander he uh, he sort of had this idea that um, that uh, that the, things are connected and you couldn't have uh, one position without recognizing the other side of the equation. And uh, that, that's sort of reductively speaking, his theory of the grotesque, that it's, that it's sort of meant to expose when used in a, as an artistic strategy, the unarticulated, the, the, the present that's not really talked about, that's there, but maybe not quite visible. Um, and so we see that in some of the work, some of the artistic works done under the banner of the grotesque, uh, I mentioned a little bit of the uh, notion of photo montage or photo collage that, that Hannah Huyck worked with in particular, but this this effort to expose kind of the Janus face, the both sides of, of things to sort of uh, bring to the surface um, kind of the, the, the unity that people like Friedlander saw uh, in, in things that might otherwise seem complete opposites. Mm-hmm. And and I wanted to talk a, a bit more in detail now about the different tactics that these artists used in, in responding to, to contemporary science. So, for example, in your chapter focusing on Till Bruchmann, you talk about how her work responds to Freud and Magnus Hirschfeld's research on sex, and in particular the fetish. So I, would, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how she responds, responds to that, uh, those scientific developments and, and claims. Mm-hmm. But the concept of the fetish for Brugman is such an interesting one because it is, it's, you know, it's kind of around this time. I mean, uh, yeah, I think the text it was written in the early 1830s. I forget the exact date or 1930s, excuse me. I think it was 32 or 33. Um, this is right before the, the text is a short story. It's, it's kind of a tale of this department store of Van Haus der Liebe, department store of love. 
And Friedlander, I'm sorry, uh, Bruchmann is, is sort of writing a satire of Magnus Hirschfeld's uh, uh, Institute of Sexual Science, and he has, in, 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 which is in the Tiergarten area of Berlin. It was destroyed shortly after Bruchmann actually wrote this story in, in about. I think it was 34, the Nazis burned the Institute and uh, you know, burned a lot of the books inside and destroyed the Institute. Um, but before it was destroyed, uh, Hirschfeld, who had been a very public advocate, a gay man himself and very public advocate for, um, for trans issues, for uh, non-gender conforming uh, issues, for gay lesbian issues in Germany, um, and kind of problematically so, he, he spoke up um, and became sort of the spokesman at times when perhaps it was um, he was speaking for and over others um, rather than, than maybe helping their cause. But uh, one of the things that he did do, and he was a student of Rudolf Fierschow's um, Friedlander. I'm sorry, I keep, I keep thinking of uh, Friedlander, but um, Hirschfeld. And one of the things Hirschfeld did um, was, was a strategy he learned from Fierschow, and that is to display to the public the scientific information to help them better understand um, what were the supposed quote-unquote causes of, of non-normalcy or abnormalcy, for lack of better phrasing. So uh, Hirschfeld had this famous uh, Zwischenstufenband. Um, he started at some point, I don't know how few there were, maybe 12 or 17 stages of gender sexual development in Hirschfeld's theory, and eventually expanded to thousands of different stages. You know, it, it was a masculine men and feminine uh, women, and all variations in between, and also uh, sort of related uh, sexual uh, orientations, uh, depending on the various stages. And so it's just sort of... Uh, now it seems quite comical uh, to think about, you know, the empirical efforts Hirschfeld was trying to do to um, to demonstrate his theory of uh, intermediary stages. But um, Brugman, uh, you know, saw it at the time, and and it was Hirschfeld was taken very seriously, and, and it was an important public figure. And uh, Brugman, who was, you know, by some standard non-gender conforming herself, her and and Hannah Hirsch were partners for a number of years, were lovers. Um, uh, Hannah Hirsch had, had been with, um, with Raoul Hausman um, in, a, in a sort of um, thruple-like situation. Hausman was married and had a daughter with his wife uh, when he and, and Hannah Hirsch, um also were engaged in a romantic uh, relationship, were lovers. Uh, but when that ended, uh, and Hannah Hirsch and Till Bruchman um, became lovers, they spent a good deal of time in Berlin, including a visiting Hirschfeld's Institute. And Brugman was quite critical of the way in which uh, Hirschfeld was using photography in his intermediary stages wall to demonstrate uh, these, these, you know, thousands at some point, oh, more than a thousand different stages of intermediary development of gender, sexual orientation, identity. And uh, she wrote the, the, the short story, Van Haus der Liebe, um, sort of playing with the notion of celluloid. And uh, it's, it's, it's a concept that has such an interesting history. If, if um, from a media studies perspective, it's a plastic. It became, you know, nitrocellulose. It became so important in early cinema for the production of what became, you know, soon became a non-viable form of, of film production because uh, the kind of filmic material that was created with nitrocellulose was extremely flammable. And caused a lot of a lot of projector <laughs> fires. So, um, Friedlander uh, is one of the things that that, that uh, Brugman plays with in the story is is um, she calls them celluloid kinda children of celluloid, uh, which which sometimes we could think of as dolls because dolls were, were were made from a kind of plastic resin at the time, and these are very common. But also, she she suggests that these celluloid children, um, whether they be dolls or, or figures, projections from celluloid, uh, from, from cinema, um, actually might be substitutes for real human subjects, both in terms of, of um, Hirschfeld's research, but also in the short story in, in, in terms of warfare. Like, we don't need to have humans fighting war anymore. We can have these celluloid kinda, these children, of, of celluloid children, um, take the place of real human subjects. So there's a kind of material dimension uh, to to Brugman's critique in that story that I find really interesting, mm -hmm. and and this brings up the the centrality of, of photography throughout your book in conjunction with this issue of, of vision and the um, the the centrality of a vision for the scientific 
uh, movements and in the discourse around them. And so you talk in particular about how in the development of German anthropology and the, the consolidation of that field, um, that photography was of particular importance in contrast to, say, in, in France and Britain. I was wondering if you could tell us more about what differentiated the field of German anthropology from um, its um, from, from that of other countries. Yeah. It's a, it's a really good question. And I have to default here a little bit to some of the really fantastic scholarship. Um, and, uh, you know, people like um, Andrew Zimmerman and, and uh, Anthropology and Anti-Humanism in Imperial Germany, which is a really brilliant study of the kind of different strains that are uh, more evident, I think, in the German tradition uh, than, than perhaps in the other European and North American traditions. That is a distinction between cultural anthropology and physical anthropology. And I think um, uh, H. Glenn Penny also does a really good job in some of his work on the museum culture of the nineteen, uh, the late 1900s and early 20th century, talking about some of those distinctions a- as well. So there is a, a real focus, and you see this almost kind of entrepreneurial aspect uh, when you look at some of the things happening with the Berlin uh, Society for Anthropology uh, in some of their journals, and, and Gustav Fritsch uh, is a case in point. Uh, where the anthropologists in Germany really want to demonstrate the physical difference among human subjects. And they want to do it um, either by bringing people to Germany, in the case of Karl Hagenbeck, who, who was hired in to bring, uh, as I mentioned, I think already, um, human subjects into the zoos in Berlin and Hamburg and elsewhere for display. That is human subjects, not from Germany, but from, from outside, from other countries, uh, mostly Africa and, um, and uh, some from Asia, broadly speaking. Uh, so there's, there's that element. But knowing that travel was not possible unnecessarily for all the anthropologists that might want to study uh, these human differences, people like Gustav Fritsch would develop techniques and actually market camera kits that they had designed to best capture human subjects uh, and photograph them. So their, their, their measurements in the empirical kind of sense of the empirical method would be comparable across different subjects. So if you, there's some pictures of this in the book. And I think a lot of the work on Frisch and, 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 and anthropology and anti, anti-humanism does a good job of this, I think, in particular, um, showing some of the grid structures and the and some of the devices that were used when, uh, when an anthropologist was uh, in a particular location photographing subjects and to try to make those photographs then viable comparative tools for evidence across across geographic time, but also uh, and, and geographic space, but also uh, also kind of historical time. So we would have this artifact. Uh, and one of the things that then you see are, are people, and, and this was kind of an amazing discovery for me. Uh, there were these albums that were sold, a Carl. Damon, in particular, his he had this album he created at the bequest uh, at the request of the um, Berlin Society for Anthropology. Uh, original photographs of people from various parts of the world, sort of in a photograph, a photographic album of kind of human subjects, and um, it's the difference between Damon's album, which is I think from the eighteen seventies. And then Fritsch's techniques, which are kind of more uh, kind of circulated in the 1890s, 1900s. Um, you see a much more cultural take with Damon's album. It's sort of people in in sort of um, maybe their their own attire uh, assembled in a way for the photographer to take uh, group photos, uh, sometimes group photos, versus Fritsch's album, which is in the 1890s, or his devices and techniques, which have you know, metal braces to put behind people's heads. So their heads are all kept in a particular position, no matter, uh, you know, when the photograph is taken or where it's taken. So I think those, those empirical elements uh, really speak to uh, the way in which the physical anthropological tradition in Germany um, became increasingly problematic, uh, especially as we, you know, it's, it's tough to separate uh, that particular tradition from what happens then with the rise of national socialism and, and various sort of, um, extermination programs and, and racist kind of programs, uh, racialized eugenics, um, and not that we should separate them, um, but there, there's that, that early history uh, that I think is interesting because some of the artists um, that I look at in the book are, are taking up some of that early history in their work and sort of 
being critical of it already in an interesting sort of way, Hannah Hirsch, uh, in particular, in some of her work in this instance. Yeah, and that's exactly what I wanted to sort of follow up on is Hannah Hirsch works in particular with, with photos and photo montage. Um, and you write that she, quote, used several tactics to destabilize the belief in scientific objectivity, unquote. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about what these methods of destabilization were. Yeah. So it's a, it's, I think she is the figure that probably gets the most attention. So a lot of folks who, um, you know, the, the title of the book was um, oddly, you know, Leah, sometimes I'm really, titles are, are much, much easier for me than content <laughs> to write. <laughs> but the title, this particular title was a long time in coming. Um, but Hannah Huch is, is um, I think, if if you look at the cover, there there's a I had a tough time with the cover because there are two images. One is actually uh, that's on the cover is a photo, uh, a photo a, a montage piece that Hannah Huch did of uh, Salomo Friedlander, and it's called the Dandy. Uh, and uh, there's another piece, there's another work that's inside the book that didn't get the cover image, and that's called Grotesque. And that piece by Hannah who he called grotesque as a photo montage from I think 1963 or 64. It's it's uh, you know a couple of decades after the period that the book really addresses, so it didn't quite make sense to do it as the cover. But in both of those instances, uh, and and in, in a number for photo montages, photo collages, Hannah Hoch is using the same kind of strategies. And basically, you know, she she does a couple of things. One that's, that's I think, recognizable is that juxtaposition plays a, such a significant role for her. And thinking back to Friedlander and this idea of unity within diversity, the idea that there's, there's two sides to the, to the conversation, that it's never uh, just a one-dimensional view. We have to take in the, the implicit, uh, the, un, the invisible uh, other side of the conversation, other side of the image, other side of the the idea into into consideration here. Um, that's kind of the motivating factor in, in Hannah Hoek's uh, photo collage, photo montage work as well, that there's a juxtaposition, the cover piece, Da Dandy, which is um, uh, is an interesting collection of uh, basically female images, uh, images of, of what were called the Neue Frau, the new woman in Germany of the 1920s. That's a key kind of... Um, figure for Hannah Hoek's work is this new woman. And I think today we think of the new woman maybe as a progressive emancipatory celebratory figure, but this was also a figure of derision and scorn and, and distrust and, and um, you know, danger in, in 20s Germany. This is a figure that represented decadence and decline for, for many people. Um, and so Hannah Hoek's use of the new, the new woman figure from photo illustrated magazines, where she cuts out uh, images of women who kind of look like this, this sort of neue Frau with the booby kopf haircut, the kind of short haircut, and in certain kinds of attire. So there's that figure in this image. But if if you take a closer look at Da Dandy, this 1919 uh, photo collage that's on the cover of the book, there's also a silhouette of a human head that these these figures sort of pasted together. Um, reveal and that head, human head is actually Friedlander. So uh, it's sort of a, an interesting piece because it's both an homage to Friedlander, you know, implicit in all this kind of thinking, but also a recognition of the danger that some of these figures uh, represented in 1920s Germany. But the other layer of the juxtaposition here that I think is more difficult to kind of see is um, it was very common, especially in the later 20s and early 30s, when other Berlin Dadaists. Um, John Hartfield, for example, uh, Raul Hausman did this as well. We're also creating photo collage, photo montage pieces, but they would re-photograph their works. So basically an early version of Photoshop um, where they would try to, to make the collage, put pieces together, and then photograph it so you couldn't tell uh, that the image was derived from two or three or four different source materials. And Maria Makala makes this point so well in, in, in much of her work on Hannah Hoek that, that Hoek was adamant not to re-photograph her, her photo collages, photo montages, because she very much wanted the evidence of hand cutting uh, in, her, in her creations to be evident, to be very, very visible. So you don't see that, obviously, in the reproductions we get from books and online and, and the internet. Um, but if you ever have a chance to see some of Hannah Hoek's photo collages, 
uh, photo montage pieces in person. And, and the Berlin Gallery, uh, for example, the Berlinische Galerie, uh, is a fantastic source for those. If you're ever in Berlin, uh, do take a trip. It's not so far from the Jewish Museum in Berlin. And they have a number of Hannah Hoek's pieces there. Um, you can see her original works and, and see how much the hand cutting, the original evidence of putting things together that are very obviously not originally together uh, is so important as one as another strategy for for someone like Hannah Hoek in terms of the grotesque and how it can help us be critical because she doesn't want us to assume these things are you know, now we're so used to these images being put together but you can imagine in the 1920s seeing a re-photographed piece you sort of might have fallen into the allure of this image being um, you know sort of this magical creative original image but it was you know we know obviously it was cut together with pieces that were then glued and re-photographed. But Hannah Hirsch didn't want to participate in any of that. She wanted the human element still very visible in her work. Yeah, I think that's certainly also something that we think about today, the idea of of smoothing over um, that which we create uh, and sort of creating this this aura of perfection is, is certainly still something we confront in terms of creating artwork or, or anything we produce to sort of put out into the world. Um, so that made me also think about you know, how the different discourses and, and frameworks you, you trace, how we can connect them to, to contemporary issues, to um, where do you sort of see uh, continuities um, or echoes into today from the frameworks that you discuss in your book? Mm-hmm. Well, you made me think, uh, Leah, of course, of deep fake videos, right? <laughs> As you mm-hmm. were talking, because I think that's in the, you know there's so much anxiety right now around um, you know there, there's a lot of anxiety at our contemporary moment around many things, and one of the things that maybe is not getting as much attention as it had been getting were deep fake videos, these sort of videos that folks create um, where they use uh, software and um, it, it, you know you you take images recordings from from people and you're able to reproduce create a video that looks authentic and real. And have this person be in the video saying all sorts of you know outrageous things that that person never would have said or doing things that that person otherwise might not have done. Um, so you know the the this sort of erasure of the the the, the human or even in this case the technical intervention uh, with the visual is uh, is such a kind of for me is such a flashback to what the Dadaists were doing and, and looking at those parallel streams with John Hartfield sort of photographing his. Uh, collages for Biz, the Berlin, Illust- Berlin Illustrator Zeitung, um, you know, re-photographing them so they look sort of smooth and clean versus Hannah Hüch and this choppy hand-cut thing that she didn't want to get rid of, so making sure it's clear that it's, there's an intervention. Um, so certainly, you know, deep fake videos and information, you know, being critical of that kind of information is, is one one strain. But, um, you know, Hannah Hüch, uh, and I don't want to kind of uh, always go back to her, but she's such an important figure in this sense. She has this this series, which you may know, Leah. It's called "From an Ethnographic Museum Aus einem Ethnographischen Museum," and a number of colleagues have written about this. I mean, Christy Wall, um, uh, currently among them, I think Christy was a Berlin program fellow a year or two ago, mm-hmm. and is just finishing her dissertation now. That I think, in great part, also deals with Hannah Hüch and some of her collages. Um, the the Aus einem Ethnographischen Museum series uh, is uh, 18 to 20 collages that he created between about 1918, 19 and 1929, 1930. And they all address at some level the ethnographic impulse in uh, German museum culture. And what those images do uh, in the tradition of the grotesque and this, this focus on juxtaposition and, and evidence of hand cutting that's so important and and sort of revealing, you know, the the implicit within uh, the explicit, the hidden within the visual, is uh, that they take images of, of mostly mostly German uh, new women, the Neue Frau imagery, but also some art historical uh, images, a little bit like uh, maybe uh, things we would see from the Guerrilla Girls today, or would see maybe twenty years ago, and that is art historical images of women displayed for kind of objectification and, and purposes of gratuity, gratuitous, you know, kind of nudity, um, and juxtaposes those kinds of images with sculptures from various colonial, colonized territories, uh, pieces that maybe were stolen and brought back to Germany, um, 
images of people in other countries that were from some of the anthropological uh, magazines published at the time in the 1910s and 1920s. And the series from an ethnographic museum really tries to show, I think, how this sort of European, -European, non-European, white, non-white, colonial colonial subject, colonized people, um, you know, kind of European uh, kind of museum um, privilege versus sort of uh, those those sort of elsewhere, um, sort of how they're they're very much kind of from his perspective, uh, I think, part of a, a common humanity. And she has this wonderful quote that I that I really like to use a lot. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase it. I don't remember it exactly, but. Uh, and this happened, I think, in the 70s, or, or maybe it was earlier, where she sort of has this in one of her exhibition catalogs that Hannah Hooks said, she likes to portray the world as as another person sees it, or as a bee sees it, or some other thing sees it, because um, as a human, she's sort of bound, bound where she is, and she uses her, her kind of her fantasy as a kind of bridge to sort of understand uh, the lives and feelings of others and other things. And uh, I think that's a really wonderful impulse we see in her work. Uh, and, and this was already, you know, this series was from the 1920s, and it certainly uh, kind of speaks to some of the things happening in Germany today, certainly the Humboldt Forum and the debates about, you know, now, thank goodness, you know, the Humboldt Forum stuff, I think, has generated a more robust discussion of Germany's colonial history. Um, and I think there are some fantastic scholarship I'm just reading um, uh a, a number of things. Tiffany uh, Florville's work on mobilizing Black Germany, for example, just does a great job of talking about Germany's colonial history from you know the eighteen uh, the late eighteen hundreds into the into the the twentieth century, and that history, you know, I, it's surprising how little that that history had been talked about before in, in Germany, sort of being sort of quote unquote late to the colonial game. Um, it was almost as if Germany never had colonies. So I think one of the benefits of something like the Humboldt Forum and the debates about repatriation of artifacts is that, wow, Germany is maybe now recognizing, and, and, and then the public, broadly speaking, is recognizing that there is a colonial history to reckon with within Germany as well. Certainly. And yeah, and my, my mind also came to that um, as I was reading your text, thinking about contemporary debates and, and, um, and what these... Um, yeah, what these um, issues can um, bring back to the surface that that were sort of um, taken out of the, the the narrative, and I think that that I'm taking up much of your your afternoon, so I, I want to bring us to a close. But before I do that, I, I wanted to hear what you're working on now, perhaps how this project um, has influenced or or helped to to spark the transition to your next project. I saw that you're working on a project entitled Internationalization Through Integration, um, Educational Reform in Creative Professions in the EU, China, and the USA. So this made me think uh, about your interdisciplinary background that you studied, economics, international relations, art, literature. So it seems to also be um, incredibly diverse in the disciplines that you, you dip into. So if you could tell me a bit more about that and what's coming next, I'd be very appreciative. Oh, happy, happy to do that. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, so what what's happened with this this project? I've got to say, teaching at an art college probably more than um, than I expected really has influenced the the kind of way I've approached some of the material and then thinking about how the other lives it might have had. So I'm really quite interested in the way in which uh, avant garde practices in general. Um, you know, are so Euro, how we, how we talk about as art historians and visual culture scholars about how we talk about um, avant-gardeism as a kind of European practice. And, and that may be surprising to some folks and like old hat to others who, who would listen to this. But um, one of the things that's made me do is, is look at Dada in general and what was happening both within the European versions of Dada you know, someone like Kristen Zara, who was a key figure, Samuel Rosenstock, who was a Romanian, uh, a Jewish Romanian refugee, uh, basically kind of hiding out in, in Zurich, Switzerland in the 1910s and helped kind of establish the Dada movement. Sort of his story within within the European avant-garde as a kind of a marginalized figure um, and, and, and maybe doubly mar- marginalized in the sense as a, as a refugee and then also as a kind of 
uh, as a Jewish figure who was like Friedlander, uh, you know, oftentimes not taken seriously by some of the other members of, of the Dada groups in the avant-garde circles, especially uh, notoriously André Breton in, uh, in France and Paris had a particular problem with Tristan Zara. <laughs> That's a, a, the stuff of Dada legend, as some of our folks will know. But I'm amazed about the way in which the, the kind of some of the Dada practices, which I don't think necessarily are inherently ontologically European in origin, have a larger global shelf life. I mean, Sara, for his part, and Adrian Sudhalter has done fantastic work in this sense. Um, Sara had this ambition with Francis Picabia to publish what was going to be called the Dada Globe project. In, and this was already taking form in the 1910s into the 1920s, um, in which they were going to solicit Dada statements from from artists and figures across the globe. And, and their their idea of the globe may have been more limited than, than you or I uh, think, Leah, but th- that was the ambition. It was going to be a transnational kind of project. And Adrian Sutalter, it was never published, but Adrian Sutalter working with the, the Met, um, I think she was working with the Met when this happened in 2016, and, uh, and, and Sarah's estate, who was really, really generous, um, that um, they were able to publish the Data Globe project and what was compiled, what was going to be that that compendium. So that came out actually a hundred years after the origins of European data in 2016. Uh, but then, you know, seeing that there were many other iterations of what we kind of refer to as the data, the critical data practice, uh, or data as this critical art movement. There, you know, the one of the texts I've I've been working on is about data in South Africa. And they, they have um, some wonderful colleagues that have worked on an exhibition in South Africa, uh, some artists who were using data strategies and tactics as an anti-apartheid critique um, already in, in the, even in the 1960s, but more presently in the 1990s, uh, in 1980s, 1990s, and sort of kind of focusing on um, Dada kind of as a critical avant-garde practice in South Africa, but also Dada in China in 1984, 85, 86. There was a there was a in shaman um, Dada uh, uh, shaman China a Dada movement under Quan Yung Ping, the Chinese artist who uh, immigrated to Paris and just recently passed away in October of twenty, I think October of twenty nineteen. And that there's a there's a Black Dada iteration as well. Um, you know, Adam Pendleton today is in Brooklyn based, still active and doing kind of this Black Dada project, which has its roots, uh, interestingly enough, in the Black Arts Movement here in California and in Oakland um, and the Black Panther, the Black Power Movement, um, with someone like Everett Leroy Jones, uh, who also is known as Amiri Baraka. So I've sort of become very interested in, in uh, you know, kind of the way in which avant-garde practices broadly are might be recast as not necessarily, um, you know, framed only as European origin stories, but trying to think through these other iterations and how do we talk about black data and shaman data and data in South Africa, and sort of the transatlantic, the transnational, the global dimensions of this critical practice that that uh, that I think some of our Berlin data friends were were engaging in the 1910s and 1920s. Well, that's very exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to reading about that. Um, yeah. And I thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me about your new book. And I hope that um, many others um, will have the pleasure of, of reading it as well now. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lee. It's been, it's been really, really a joy for me. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.